College Football Nerds here talking TCU and Oklahoma State. Another massive showdown this weekend. Week 7 is bringing it, Josh. I got Josh here with me. We're getting nerdy with y'all. Um, Josh, we did the TCU-Kansas game last week. Both picked TCU to win. Proved to be correct, even though we took some slings and arrows from Kansas fans. And this week, it's another matchup of undefeated. And Josh... We just got finished talking about Michigan and Iowa, or Michigan-Iowa game in the process of talking about Michigan and Penn State. And those teams have faced a lot of teams that don't play good offense, some play good defense. And that was a defensive struggle discussion. And this is kind of the opposite. So when you go into predicting a game where both defenses are known to yield a good bit, um, really, how do you how do you predict that game, or what really sticks out, and sort of things that you think about when it might end up a track meet? Anytime you start dealing with games that are going to be on either end of the scoring stratosphere, uh, which is one where you're dealing with a really low scoring game or the other high scoring game, um, you start having to figure out who's going to have more chunk plays, more negative plays. Uh, because those tend to sort of set the boundaries. And we talked sometimes in the past about having freeze points and stall points and break points and sort of this idea that offenses have a certain point where they shut down and a certain point where they just run rampant. It doesn't really matter if you get eight yards per play or 12, because at that point you're just moving the ball on a continual basis anyway. The thing that stops you is actually negative plays. It's not so much how much you're getting on average. It's an interception where it's a seven-yard sack um, something that puts you far enough behind the sticks that now one incompletion will turn into a loss set of downs. And completion percentage is always a big statistic in that world because you can have really, really high yard per play numbers, but if you run once and throw twice, if you string two incompletions together, uh, you're going to have a turnover or, you know, turnover downs or punt or whatever because you're going to get to fourth down, even though maybe the next drive you complete three passes in a row and they're all 20 yards and you go 60 yards in three plays. It doesn't matter if you string together incompletions. So with all that said, it really comes down to consistency to quarterback play. How well can you get out on third downs? How much do you give up negative plays? I care a little less in these games about explosiveness. Now explosiveness is big because what it does is it means you don't have to string together quite as many plays we talked last year quite a bit with Georgia that if they got in a game where they had to score 40 points, they'd probably be in trouble. And the reason for that is their drives would frequently be 10 to 14 play drives. And if you do that, it only takes one sack on any one of those sets of downs to put you behind the sticks to put you in trouble to get a first down. And it's so hard to sustain long drives like that on a continual basis. Um, I think these teams probably don't have that problem. They're probably going to have explosiveness, which means fewer plays needed to sustain a drive long enough to score. But your ability to avoid negative plays, one, and two, the quarterback's ability to consistently execute those plays, that's, for example, high completion percentage, not missing your deep shots, those are the things that allow you to win a barn burner um, because it usually comes down to missed opportunities in a high-scoring game versus in a low-scoring game where it's more about trying to make things happen and you know you get the little monster nittany lion back there and uh doesn't take much for the the witcher to sort of knock him off right so um yeah this is a game i think that's going to be defined more by missed opportunities than made opportunities because i think both these offenses are going to be able to move the ball quite a bit and put up a lot of points josh one of the things that annoys me a little bit i've been fighting with people on twitter with this all year is this notion that you look, Oklahoma State, I don't think they have a great defense. But I think that a lot of the defensive numbers that are going to show up in modeling, that are going to show up in overall ranking statistics, come from two games, um, Baylor and Central Michigan. And these are two games where Oklahoma State led at one point against Central Michigan 51-15, to and at one point against Baylor 23-3. to So... Maybe a little less the Baylor one because it was still 23. Like That's not a huge blowout. But in both cases, this is a situation where they were facing offenses that were in comeback mode and having to throw a lot and having to and, – and, and maybe relaxing intentionally with a prevent defense. So from those two games, I'm not 
really that upset with Oklahoma State defensively. Now, 31 to Texas Tech when Donovan Smith's not playing, that's a little concerning. And that's 31 and three quarters. They figured it out in the fourth quarter, but they gave up 31 and three quarters. Um, but even that game, when you look into the production of that game, um, you know, it's 6.1 yards per attempt. It's three point something yards per carry running. So they didn't really produce in terms of yards per play enough to merit a 31 point total. So I think that, you know, and maybe I'm tipping my hand a little bit here. I think that between these two teams, both of them have not so great defenses. That's accepted. But Oklahoma State's not so great defense maybe is a little bit of fool's gold and maybe they're better than advertised. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting conversation point. Do you mind if I go ahead and start bringing up some model stuff so that we have a baseline for the conversation? No, I think that's a good good idea. All right, so this is our awkward live segue, trying to be all natural here. This is as natural as you're ever going to see a nerd be. Uh, Oklahoma State gives up, in our model, 100% of opponent rushing averages and 113% of opponent Afri- passing averages. To your point, their numbers might be slightly inflated, but if they are, they're inflating them to a point that's bad. I mean, 100% of opponent rushing averages for a P5 team is a bad number. You still got bad teams in there, right? You still played Central Michigan. You still played, I don't know, Arizona State. I think they theoretically play football right now. And you only manage 100%. So when you compare it to the teams those teams played, you don't really want to look like an average pack team or an average G5 team. And that's kind of where Oklahoma State is against the run. And against the pass, 113% is just a really bad number. You don't want to be over 10% worse than opponent averages. You're 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 worse than average, and worse than average considering half the teams people played have been out of conference, weak opponents in general. TCU is a somewhat solid run defense, 83% of opponent averages. I, I would say they're reasonably good. There's reasons to be a little questionable there. Again, scheduling comes into play. You've played an Oklahoma team that I don't know quite where they're at. Um, and then Dylan Gabriel goes down injured, which really affected the run stats that Oklahoma was able to put up in that game. Uh, compared to uh, other statistics. And you also faced Kansas when Kansas loses their running quarterback. Uh, So that does inflate your run statistics a little bit. Uh, 103% of opponent passing averages. Again, I would consider that to be a bad number. Um, It's a little more in the mediocre range than where Oklahoma State is. But you do have two defenses. One, Oklahoma State's that is, I would say, objectively bad. And these numbers from Oklahoma State are somewhat similar to what Ole Misses have been the past couple years when we've done shows. Uh, and TCU's numbers are mediocre. They're comparable right now. Oddly enough, I'm going to look at this right now because I think this just dawned on me. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're pretty similar to Tennessee's. Um, so, yeah, you've you basically got Tennessee's defense playing Ole Miss's defense if you're an SEC fan. I'm sure Big 12 fans don't appreciate that. But for the way I, I wrap my head around it with the type of teams they play and where they've been at, and I say this from having seen those teams play at a pretty consistent level for the past few years – one is bad and one's worse. And then offensively, I think these teams are very, very good. So, yeah, it still comes back to me to the fact that I think both of them are going to move the ball quite a bit, right? On the flip side, for me, you got to go back a few weeks for a little bit of concern with TCU. They never really got separation with SMU. And I know SMU, there's history there. I get it. Um 42-34 against a team that got murdered by UCF last weekend. Um, 38-31 against a Kansas team without their starting quarterback. Oklahoma, they still give up 24 points. Um, I don't know that there's a shame in that when you know Dylan Gabriel's healthy. But having said all that, like I still think there's some question marks around TCU and in there were some stretches against Kansas where I thought that there was football, some bad football being played. Um, but on the flip side, my guy, Spencer Sanders, who I flagged in the off season. So like in August as somebody I was really high on for this year, he's not been great. Like his baseline numbers are pretty good. But if you look at some of these games, like if you get into the numbers, they're not amazing. So, Josh, I'm really struggling with this. And usually I go first after, like, the model discussion. Um, but I'm going to let you give your pick first, and, and then I'm going to think about the reasoning you give. 
and maybe make my own pick. So why don't you go first? So I'm going to lean on the model a little bit here. So we were talking about those statistics. The model scoring statistic, which is what most people, I think, look at and then go, okay, great, and then close our video down. This is 50 to 42. And I often note that the yardage statistics are more important than the score statistics. And there, it's pretty remarkably lopsided. It, it actually has Oklahoma State sitting at 5.8 yards per play and TCU at 8.6 that's that's a gap, guys. Two and a half yards per play is big. Usually anything around two yards per play is a blowout. That, to me, is enough to give me a little more confidence in TCU, and it backs up a lot of what I felt like was true between these two teams. I've always felt like Spencer Sanders has a lot of potential as a quarterback, and he's always been very streaky. He's good and bad, off and on. Um, I'm a little confused why... Adrian Martinez is the superstar this year. I think people are so surprised to see Kansas State undefeated. And, you know, Adrian Martinez is putting up good numbers running. He's not putting up good numbers passing or not on any sort of consistent basis. And at some point, they're going to play some better teams. And I think I think he's going to look a lot more pedestrian. Spencer Sanders, I think, will scale better. And he's always going to be able to produce somewhat. But he is hot and cold. I think Max Duggan has a little more potential to just be a more traditional passer to execute at a higher level more consistently. See more consistently. And I have more trust in Max Duggan and that TCO offense to be able to win a shootout. I have more trust in Max Duggan to be a consistent quarterback. And for that reason, I'm going to pick TCU and I'm uh, just to avoid borrowing from the model. I'll tweak it a little bit. Um, you know, I'll say 51, 42, um, yeah, taking a point off it. I, I think it's going to be a shootout. Either team could win. It won't surprise me. And that's that's not a cop-out. Uh, I, I really do think this is a game that could really hinge on turnovers. But it does come down to the fact that TCU, let me throw another one out there. If you want to talk like explosiveness metrics, right? TCU's explosive, explosiveness numbers, 1.51 on offense to 1.38 allowed on defense. So, Badly explosive defense in terms of what they've allowed, but still more on offense overall, passing um, around 1.8, 1.9 in both metrics. That's kind of rough that they're really high explosiveness offense and defense, but Oklahoma State's on the other side of it. Their explosiveness metrics defensively are worse than their explosiveness metrics are good offensively. And so it's just a little bit of edges that sort of pile up in a game that I think is going to be high scoring. I think TCU is just the more consistent program uh, in terms of their ability to sustain offensive production. And that's why I tend to lean TCU for the same reasons that I lean with them over the Kansas game, the same reasons that I think they won, they won the, Kansas game. the Kansas game. So I would not put money on this game. Just straight up, if I were betting on this game, I would not put money. But if I were to put money on something about this game, it would actually be the under. I think both of these defenses are better than we think they are. I think especially Oklahoma State's defense is getting beaten up in the media, beaten up by the fans because of points they gave up in games that were totally in control, especially that Central Michigan game. Um the thing is, though, what you said about Max Duggan, I actually agree on. I think Spencer Sanders, if he gets hot, they could run away with it. But on average, Max Duggan's going to be the more productive quarterback between the two. I think this is a pick em game on a neutral site. Um, I'm going to go with TCU 33, Oklahoma State 30. And... I don't have a lot of confidence about that, but what I do have confidence about is these defenses playing better than they've shown so far this year in the raw numbers. And that, that means I'm taking that under 68 and a half that we're at right now. Josh, give me one final thought on this game in that. Are we going to whomever wins this game? Are we going to overrate them too much or jumping them up to that kind of, six ranked tier like five six in our top 10 or in a national top 10 is it going to be deserved i 
<laughs> we're at the end of the video and hopefully people that have stuck around now <laughs> like us well enough to hear my honest opinion. I think there's going to be an overreaction. Um, I, I've been hesitant to rank these teams particularly high in my top 10. Again, they're good offenses, and I think they're legitimately good offenses. And TCU, I think in particular, is kind of underrated nationally. For whatever reason, they seem to be one of the better ones, maybe on par with Tennessee, I'm not sure. Um, but I think the defenses are shaky, and I, frankly, I think there are a lot of shaky defenses in the Big 12 right now. Uh, and then when you look at schedule, it, it's going to pan out pretty quickly to find out who these teams are, right? Because Oklahoma State turns around and they got to play Texas, Kansas State, and Kansas in the next three games. TCU is going to have to turn around, uh, and they're going to have to play Kansas State, and then they still have Texas on their schedule. They still have Baylor on their schedule. They still have Iowa State on their schedule. They've had And a good Texas had, Tech team. Right. They've had really backloaded schedules, uh, and I think that's – the reality of that, I think Kansas is also in that, has sort of created some, somewhere along the line, we're going to find out there's some bad perceptions about what the pecking order in the Big 12 is. That is not a shot at either one of these teams. I'm not saying I have any reason to think that these teams are grossly overrated, but I think we're going to find out someone is. Uh, and I think it's going to be interesting to see. That is the positive on a round-robin conference, that, which is what the Big 12 is right now, that they all have to play each other. So there's no way for a schedule to hide warts, not saying Georgia maybe has a weak schedule, but let's just say hypothetically Georgia maybe dodges the better teams in the SEC this year with the exception of Tennessee. They don't have that privilege in the Big 12. So we're going to find out who they are and whether or not they're overrated this week. Who cares, right? You know, the playoff isn't decided in a week. We're going to know who they are by the end of the season, and that all, that's all that matters. So right now, to the extent that we're negative or projecting, we're just trying to guess where they're going to end up at the end of the year. If you are who they think they are, you know that's going to prove itself on the field. So my opinion doesn't really matter at that point. I will say that we might overreact to the winner of this game and underreact or overreact to the what we perceive as badness of the loser of this game. I don't know that the loser of this game is, is you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the loser of this game ends up playing in that Big 12 championship game. I think one of these two teams will be one of the two teams in the Big 12 championship game, not necessarily the winner of this game because you're both undefeated right now. So you've got a little bit of headroom uh, relative to the, to the rest of the league. Um, right now I am feeling that one of the other teams might end up being Texas. All right, let us know in the comments what you think this score is going to be. And, uh, man, thanks for hanging with us this long. Send all your hate mail to Josh the Grim Reaper at cfbnerds.avenue, um, <laughs> and, and he'll respond to you in kind. Thanks so much, y'all, for hanging out with us this long. Have a great week, and God bless.